Well, good morning, church. Merry Christmas. Merry, Merry almost Christmas. Well, we're going to get started. We're going to do some worship this morning. If you're uh, with us or online, feel free to stand up and we'll get singing. And we've got a Christmas song for you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to invite you to be seated. We're going to continue our time in worship. And it is the second Sunday of Advent. And so I'm going to invite the Duke family up and come on up. Yeah, I was like, somebody's looking up here. Okay. 
Not you, Pastor Ken. All right. So what's going to happen here is Rachel's going to start reading, and when you hear that hope candle, Josh, you'll light that first candle, and then she'll start reading about love, and then they're going to light that love candle. Go ahead, Rachel. Last week, we lit the hope candle. Paul encouraged, encourages us in Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The second candle of the Advent is called the love candle. As we anticipate Christmas, we remember our loving Savior, how he came once as a baby that the world through him might be saved and how he will return in glory. Zephaniah 3:17 The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. How do we know that Jesus came in love and to demonstrate love? John 15:9-13 Jesus said, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And what does this mean for the followers of Christ? Jesus told his disciples, John 13, 34, 35. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Scripture reminds us this. We love because he first loved us. Awesome. Thank you. Rachel, come over by the, you know, we're just going to do it right in the middle of service. Why not? I mean... We're in charge here, right, you guys? Love that. Look at that precious. Can you just show your appreciation to this precious family? Let's do that. I love it. Thank you. Just precious, precious folks. And family's important, isn't it? It is. Listen, if you have with you your communion, we're going to take communion together. If you didn't get it when you came in, it's on the back tables. We can get that for you, or you can get that. Uh, and so if you're new or it's been a while, remember that top, that top thin layer peels off first to get to the bread, okay? So let's go ahead and get to the bread. If you're at home and joining us online, whatever you have, crackers, bread, uh, whatever you have there, let's get that bread out. I would have imagined the scene around Jesus at the supper time was the traditional painting, the picture, the famous picture, right, is Jesus with the disciples. What's not pictured is the family right here, the family that was here, the women, the children, and others who were there gathered with him. And uh, it was important. The words that Jesus said, this is my body that is broken for you. Paul, and we've been in this series in the letters, letter to Corinth, he was instructing them, when you take communion, you remember Christ's body that was broken for you and I, the bread that represents Christ's body. Let's do this. Would you hold the bread up? And if you're at home, you hold that up, and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who gave everything. God, it demonstrates your incredible, magnificent, lavish love for us. That he paid the ultimate sacrifice and his body was broken so that we might be forgiven and thus live in eternity with you, God. And so we thank you for that. We remember your body now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take the bread together. People online can't hear it, but it's fun to hear all your little crinkling noises uh, as you're getting ready for communion. When Jesus was gathered with the disciples and the family and the women and the children who were all who were there, they poured the wine. They did. And as Jesus poured it, he said, this is my blood, my new covenant I give you. 
my blood, that it represents my shed blood, that for all who would believe on Jesus Christ, acknowledging him Lord and King, his sacrifice on the cross means something. By, scripture says that when we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins. And he does that through his son, Jesus Christ. Would you raise uh, the cup with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for your shed blood. And we do remember your covenant that you give us. Lord, we also remember your promise that comes with it, that you will return again. And so, God, we humbly come before you through confession of our sins and acknowledgement that you are faithful and just and like no other God. And because you're faithful, you'll keep your promises and you will return again. And so we celebrate that and we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take the cup together. Good. Oh, it's so good to be together in person. It's great to have our church family online with us as well. You are so precious and important. Here's my prayer for you. And for those who are here, if you would like and you're able, let's stand. And we're going to go right back into rejoicing and celebrating God. Let's do that together.
in your promises my confidence is your faithfulness and I will rest in your promises my confidence is your faithfulness and I will
the world.
treasures that fade are never enough. You came along, then you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. There's nothing.
worship you. I worship you.
shall be As we were singing Waymaker, I couldn't help myself. I had to run downstairs and see the Rhodes family. Tracy, let's go to that camera and see if you can even see the TV over here on the far side. They're down there. Let's wave. Everybody online, wave. Downstairs, a wave. They can see themselves. We created a downstairs option uh, two weeks ago. And uh, the reason I had to run down there is when we were singing Waymaker, I was suddenly struck by remembering answered prayers. Dustin Road is on our worship team and plays the drums and the bass, and their family is just precious to us. They've adopted beautiful children. Well, Dustin Road's mom was in the hospital a couple weeks ago, completely unresponsive. She was at death's door. And Julie messaged us and activated the prayer chain, and the next report back was she's responsive. 
they sent her to Eugene, and uh, she was getting better, but then she had a really hard day and was depressed. How many feel those days when you're medically just challenged and you feel sick? And it, Right? I mean, my goodness, you just avoided death, but still it's there. She was having a hard day, and Julie messaged us, and our prayer team and our folks faithfully prayed. Folks, she was released the next day. She was released the next day. Answered prayer. Waymaker. Listen, here's what I want to do right now and just being reminded of that. Something tangible, somebody we know. Listen, if you need a touch from the living God, if it's physical, if it's emotional, just your spiritual being, you just need to be refreshed. Just a sense like Vicky feeling depressed. If that's you, here's what I want you to do. Just in faith, slip up your hand, and I'm going to pray for all of us. If you need a touch from a living God, physically, emotionally, spiritually, just lift your hand up and let's pray together. God, you are the way maker. God, you see these hands that are lifted and you see the ones that aren't. The folks who are online, God, you see them. Lord, we raise our hand, understand that you are the one and true living God. God, as these hands are lifted up, I believe you're going to divinely touch each one in such a unique way. It is undeniable who you are. There is no mistake, God, of your love and provision for each hand that's lifted. God, if these hands are lifted for loved ones who need a touch from you, God, I would just pray right now you divinely touch those loved ones wherever they may be. That God, today, when they interact with family members, God, part of their testimony is something happened right about 1120 today. And it was the living God divinely touching each one. God, we pray over our families our children and our children's children and our great-grandchildren. Be with each one. Refresh each one, body, soul, and spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can you all, let's all say, what does amen mean, by the way? So be it. Let's all say amen out loud together. Amen. Oh, let's do it again. Amen. Now we'll join Dustin and Julie downstairs. Amen. Amen. So be it, Lord. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, thank you uh, for ushering us into his presence. Appreciate you, folks. Uh, just an amazing job that they do. I want to share a couple of announcements for you before Pastor Ray comes out. The first one is it's Tribe Sunday. Oh, come on. It's Tribe Sunday. Okay, there we go. Tribe Sunday means our junior high uh, high schoolers, right? Downstairs, right after church, you're going to have lunch together with Pastor Kaylee. And if you don't like Pastor Kaylee, well, then just have lunch, and that's okay. <laughs> See, I did that because she pokes at me. Just, you know, but uh, we love Pastor Kaylee. Do we love Pastor Kaylee? She does an amazing job and uh, love the work that she does. And... Uh, December 20th is our special candlelight service, and so we want you to be aware of that. It, we are doing uh, the Grinch of play. We're not telling you who the Grinch is, uh, but anyways, for all those, you know who you are. You are the Who's of Coquilleville. The Who's of Coquilleville. Darlene has talked to you. Darlene, raise your hand. And right after service, you also are going downstairs uh, and you're going to be practicing uh, a couple things really briefly. And so, and if anybody else wants to do it and be a part of it, just come downstairs after service. She would love to have you. By the way, on December 20th, we'll remind you, we actually want you to dress very vibrant, very festive, very Christmassy, and throw a little Whoville in there, if, or Coquilleville in there if you really want to. And uh, we're just going to have a great time. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I described to you some things we're partnering with in missions. Adopt a pastor. We're wanting to adopt a church and a pastor in the Middle East. How we do that is by raising $1,000, and that covers that church for a month. Another missions that we're wanting to target for sure this month is our Compassion First. We've been partnering with Compassion First now for about four years. And uh, just an important ministry and so here's what I want to do. I think the best thing to do is play this video so you can describe to you how they're extending Christ's love to a broken world. Let's do that.
As the sun sets, the, you'll see these silhouettes of women just um, standing in front of or next to these massive graves, just waiting, waiting for someone to, to pull up and to give them 75 cents and to, and to serve as a customer for food for their kids. And so that's the reality there. During the day, they clean the graves. During the night, they stand next to the graves to sell themselves um, out of desperation. They don't see themselves having any other option. You go in there and you're struck by the darkness of it all, and yet there is light. And nowhere else does light shine more brightly than in the darkness. That light is piercing that darkness. And because they've lived in the shadows of death and of this graveyard for so long, they are open and they get the value of what new life looks like, what a second chance looks like, what hope looks like. They get it in a way that we do not get. We're seeing these women literally living. I mean, literally these women and children are living in the shadows of graves. And in the Roman world, the cross wasn't a hopeful symbol. The cross meant death. When God comes and he infuses himself, it's, it's totally redeemed into life. I mean, you don't have a resurrection experience without the death experience. Every perception or my view of God and how he works has just exploded. You know, who else is more positioned to know life than those who, who understand death? What's happened is beyond anything that we had hoped or expected. And it's because of you. It's because God has included you, God's included me to be a part of what he's doing there. And so right there in the middle of that cemetery, God has given us opportunity to have a house, to have a home, to receive business training, to receive tutoring and mentoring, of scholarshiping and a micro business. So um, her daughter, who was 13 at the time, came to us and said, pray that God would show me a different way. And so we were able to offer her um, scholarshiping. She is doing really, really well. There are 10,000 people who live in this community. A light comes on, and then that light is spread to someone else. And just, we're just seeing person by person, just light and life come. We're going to build upon the great things that we've seen. So just continually relationship building, um, scholarshiping, micro business loans. Everything that we've hoped has been exceeded. And so I am fully convinced that God is just getting started. And we'll build upon the momentum and build upon the beautiful foundation that God's laid there for us. No longer are they the marginalized, waiting for a handout, waiting for help, but they are the ones who God is actually empowering. And he's entrusted a piece of who he is that no one else has. I'm telling you that God is taking that brokenness that they've known and God is putting something together and creating this mosaic and this masterpiece of who he is that, that, that is not complete without them. Good, I wanted to get that in front of you. Compassion First is who we've been partnering with. They have just done an amazing job with the kids and women. And yeah, you can slide that one up there, Tracy, all the way. There we go. And here's what I want you to know. For the month of December, they received a generous gift, a matching gift of up to $125,000. So dollar for dollar, every bit of money they receive in December will be matched dollar for dollar. 
So besides our regular giving to Compassion First, we're wanting to give above and beyond that. So here's what we want you to know. For Adopt a Pastor, for Compassion First, our tithes and offering baskets are in the back. There's envelopes. If you want to give to Compassion First, put it in the envelope and say Compassion First, or just say Missions. We're going to make sure we send every bit as much as we can to take advantage of that. And we're looking forward. I just uh, was on with them. They've been sending out emails. Uh, I think four or five of their young ladies who were brought up as preteens, preteens through their program and education and training have chosen to go to university. And they're in the middle of raising funds uh, for those uh, young women. Uh, I think two of them, it said two of them want to go into the medical field. Another one's going to Bible college. And I forget what the other one is. But isn't that amazing? And just important work, I just, it was really important to share that with you and what Compassion First is doing. All right, Victoria, are you here somewhere? Whoa, there you are. Come on up, Victoria. If you don't know, Victoria is my niece, and uh, we're together all the time, so we're not too concerned about socially distancing because we are family and together all the time. Is it, what's the word for family? All right. So if you remember, we're in the series, What's Love Got to Do With It? 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 8. You've been here. You know that we've been learning sign language. So get your hands free. Get ready. We're going to learn. Let's throw that scripture up. So we started with love is patient. So let's do patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. And last week, it is not self-seeking. Little feedback area. And then the last one is it does not easily anger. That's this week. So not easily angered. That looks, oh, anger. I was going to let, that looks like you're petting a Furby or something. But the anger part came in after. Okay, so not easily and then angered. All right, okay. All right, are you ready? Now, later in the scripture, it kind of all breaks down from there because you all are just waving your hands while she eloquently speaks with her hands. But keep practicing, okay? Because by the end of this series, uh, we'll, we'll have this down. All right. I'll try to go slow for people here and online. And now I'll read 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, and you follow along with Victoria, if you'd like, in sign languaging. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. <laughs> You're awesome. Thank you, Victoria. Appreciate you. Yeah. All right. Great job. All right. We're going to keep practicing that. Well, if you remember, Paul's talking about agape love. So we'll go to the next slide. Agape love is defined as this, a pure no strings attached, nothing is manipulated, willful, it is your choice, a sacrificial love that intentionally desires another's good. Agape love, you are intentionally desiring another's good. Let's go to the next slide, Susan. We're going to go to the check-in. So we've been learning about love that is patient, kind, doesn't envy. We talked about being generous, doesn't boast. We talked about humility, doesn't dishonor others. You're not rude and isn't selfish. This is when we do a check-in. This week, how did you do with your agape love? We've been talking about collaborating with the Holy Spirit in your everyday engagements. How did you do this week? Just one or two words, and uh, we'll do a little bit of a check-in here. Inpatient. All right. So not patient. So... What was the next step then, Bill? Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, how, how many experienced that? You, you Suddenly you realize, oh, there it is. I just, I kind of messed up. What's the next obvious thing to do? Ask for forgiveness. Absolutely, repentance. Get us back oriented towards God, yep. 
Anybody else? Online, too, by the way, if you share online, Pastor Ken Duke's tracking. Well, you all just kind of had a blah week. <laughs> Apparently, it was only Bill that had a hard time. You know, it's not just about the bad, it's the good, too, right? Yes, Amanda. Oh, great. It's Amanda, got, getting to share kindness and love that changed the attitude. You know, it's even more than just the attitude. I think it's just kind of the atmosphere, too, right? I mean, just the, surround, the general surroundings. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Amanda. Yeah, Mike. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So what was your response? <laughs> I, lo I love it. Yes, thank you. Good reminders. That's kind of a tail off of last weekend. When we're driving and we get, well, all the things that we get when we're driving, yes. You remember last week I talked about we can build a rationale in our head that it's in our car, our private surroundings. Surely they can't hear it, but we speak it, right? Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. Be, just, be, just being aware. Man, I, I can't, I've talked to so many people. I'm going to say for me, this series, Agape Love, in this particular series has been challenging, refreshing, aware. Oh, my goodness. You know, part of being aware is not my need, but the needs around me. It's connecting to I'm not now selfish. Actually, there's great needs around me. Yes, right here. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, great. And and most of us heard but generosity, but but the challenge of being on the receiving end of generosity it can be challenging, which I think just as equally to be generous is just as equally to be receivable, to receiving as well. Because believe it or not, if we receive if we refuse the gift, we then expose possibly challenges in our own heart, but that person who needed to give doesn't get a chance to give. Yeah, right? Yeah. Somebody else raise your hand. Ronnie. Being generous to the least of us? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. How many know it's hardest to be generous to a panhandler? I, okay. I'm, I'm a pretty honest pastor, so I, it, it's challenging for me. I, I, I have preconceived judgments that I come to the table with when I'm in the car. I love my wife. My wife's approach is she's generous with all without judgment. This story a long time ago, but I remember she shared the story. She was pulling out of Walmart, and a guy was very creative and had a cardboard bullseye. And he said, throw the quarter and hit the bullseye. So she rolled down her window and threw the quarter and hit the bullseye. <laughs> she doesn't even hesitate, but it's her generous heart and then just wanting to engage joyfully. And I think that's part of it, that generosity is engaging joyfully without, remember that, that definition, willful and without manipulation. Yes, online. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, nice. So sharing kindness with a baby uh, in the ER. Pastor Shania up in Alaska online with us, who uh, was part, one of our interns and moved, got married, whatever, <laughs> and then moved. Uh, somebody else from Coquille said be impatient. And then Pastor Kaylee's mom, uh, California, uh, just challenged with the sh new shutdowns. And uh, yes, those are all real. Aren't those all real? And uh, being patient. And so, good, good job. Listen, we want to keep engaging this way. When we do and when we're aware, things happen in us. Change begins to take place. And how many know that 
change needs to happen in the world around us. It's Christ that needs to happen in the world around us. And he calls us to be his hands and feet. So that change is going to happen through you. The miraculous, God's power, his spirit in you. To be what? His witnesses, right? Pastor Ray, come on up. And uh, Pastor Ray, I'm not going to give a big flowery uh, introduction. I did say some kind words in the bulletin, though. And, uh, and uh, Pastor Ray, while he gets his ears and microphone all set, um, just an incredible dear friend. Janice, if you're online watching or later, we love you as well. Ray's uh, wife. Uh, he's just been an amazing friend and support. And uh, not only for me, but for all of you as well. And so I'm going to step off and okay. give that feedback. And yeah, I didn't do the feedback. I just, I'm just i following put instructions. That, uh, push that microphone a little closer. Bend closer, it, it bends. It bends. Closer. There you How's go. that? There you go. Good morning. Yeah, Janice is actually on her way to Portland to take her sister in for the second eye surgery. Otherwise, she'd be watching this morning. And uh, my daughter may be watching. Hi, Rachel whatever camera is on. Uh, although, you know, that's always suspicious because when my daughter was little, my wife discovered that if she, daughter never wanted to go to bed. I don't know if you had children like that, but she just never wanted to go to bed. But my wife discovered that if she put on my sermon tapes when we put daughter to bed, it just calmed her right down and she went to sleep. <laughs> I saw a similar dynamic every Sunday morning, but not with my children. A couple of things, just uh, housekeeping things. Don't worry about the PowerPoint slides. I'm not going to use any of them, so we don't, have to, we don't have to worry about that. I'm glad to be with you, and I'm glad that the people online are with us this morning because we're talking about love that doesn't get angry quickly. Uh, I've got a bunch of things to say. in part two some other time. But I've got some pointed things to say for us this morning. And so I would like us to approach the Father and ask God to be with us this morning and work in us as we talk about the subject of anger. And if talking about anger just really makes you mad, then you're probably in the right place. <laughs> and so could we pray together this morning and ask God, to be with us. Father, I pray that you would come and guide our time together. Help me communicate clearly the concepts of your word. And Lord, we open our hearts and we open our minds to what you're doing in us. We pray that you would transform us and make us more effective as just ourselves but especially make us effective in communicating the wonders of who you are to the world around us. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. I graduated with a degree in cross-cultural studies. Uh, a couple of years later, I did a lot of coursework, kind of seminar work on intercultural stuff, and then ra racial reconciliation. All of that is a background to the story I'm about to tell you. It was a Friday afternoon in Southern California, and I had finished my last appointment and was hoping to get on the freeway before the traffic all got into its worst mode. And if, if you're not from an area like Southern California, you don't know, 15 minutes can make the difference of life either home or stuck. Just, just 15 minutes. And so I ran from my last appointment. I had it scheduled to where I could get into my car, my truck, actually, it was new back then, get out of the place where I was, get on the freeway, get home, and then have it all just back up behind me. And so uh, as I was finishing the appointment, the individual I was coaching had a few more questions. I was trying to stay engaged because I knew that freeway was starting to fill up. Uh, I, I succeeded in that part just fine, but uh, as I, you know, left the individual I was coaching, I turned the corner and I started sprinting for the parking garage. Now, 
It was Friday in this town, and so the parking garage, I was way up on the top of the parking garage. And so I'm sprinting up the stairs to get to my truck, and it was already starting to back up because it's Friday and people were coming for uh, special programs downtown. They were coming for meals, and I just, you know, in my truck, wanting to back up, not wanting to hit anything, not for their sake, but because I didn't want to hurt my truck. And uh, finally got down after uh, somebody mentioned uh, drivers who don't know how to drive. Uh, That garage was full of them that evening. But finally got down to the stop sign, and now there's pedestrians. And I'm, I'm 150 feet from the intersection to get a straight shot to the freeway. And every pedestrian in the planet was in the crosswalk. And then there was some lady who didn't know where she was going who had stopped in the middle of the cross, in the intersection. And so I'm trying to exercise what little I have left in that day for patience. And uh, somebody turned in front of me. I finally got through. I thought, I'm through. And this guy in front of me <laughs> pulled over. There are two lanes. I just need to get to the right-hand lane, turn right, head to the freeway. He, he pulled into the right lane, then he pulled back out, and he pulled into the right lane, and he pulled back out. All of this, I'm, all of this, like, he's driving almost in neutral. <laughs> and the tension in my body is I think, if I don't get to the freeway, I'm just going to sit there. I might as well pull off and have dinner, but I don't want to. I want to go home. And so I started to get angry. I have to be truthful with you. And uh, my window was down. It was hot, sticky day in Southern California. My window was down. The air conditioning hadn't really kicked in yet. And uh, I'm just, oh, come on. And uh, finally, in a moment of just fleshy inspiration, I hammered on my horn and just, I mean, I laid on the horn. I was right up on the guy's bumper. I laid on the horn. And you could see now I saw his whole family was in the car. They were all startled by this. And he, he didn't move over it right away. He just kind of crept back over into the left lane. And now we're at the, st- and we sat through a green light, by the way. I mean, I, you know, I got to get to the freeway. And now I'm up to the stop line, and I'm waiting for a break in the traffic so I can turn. And I noticed that the window in his car rolled down. And I hear this angry voice. What the bleep are you, what is wrong with you, you jerk? And I turned, and it was a whole Hispanic family of petrified people in this car. And in that moment, I yelled back, waiting for you to learn to drive. (laughs) And all of this is happening just, you know, really fast. As I'm saying that, I'm realizing it's a Hispanic family in the car, and I am playing the role of the old angry white guy in a new pickup. I, I just <laughs> deflated as they rolled their window back up to get away from me because who knows what I was going to do next. And I made my right-hand turn, and I'm driving down the freeway. And I'm saying, God... That was such a marvelous display of me, but not of you. Love is not easily provoked. At that moment, I did not love that family. At that moment, I had been caught in a cycle of anger. You know the cycle of anger, right? There's a triggering event. Something happens. You feel that initial, and then there's an escalation that begins to occur. Anger now builds, and it's going to come out. It's going to come out in one of several ways. It can come outside, and anger exploding outside happens either in a display of cursing, slamming doors, throwing, or or it can happen outside in a display of 
passive anger where now I simply ignore what's happening. How are you doing? Fine. Oh, no, no, I'm not. No, on the inside, I am seething. But I'm not going to explode because for whatever reason, maybe I learned that wasn't safe or maybe I'm a Christian, so I don't think I should get mad. Uh, but I'm going to be mad anyway. I'm not going to admit I'm mad. I'm just going to ignore you. So anger can, as it escalates, it can, it can explode outwardly or, or it can explode inwardly. This is not passive now. Now, outward is a, or passive is an outward, but it's different than that violent response. When I talk about exploding inward, this is, this is your thoughts turn, how could I be so stupid? What an idiot I am. And it escalates even beyond that to self-harm. And you find that people are caught in either cutting or some kind of addiction or I mean, it just, it has escalated beyond. So, there's a triggering event. There's an escalation. There's a crisis that happens. This hits a peak. In this case, the crisis was I hit the horn. I yelled at the people. And then the final stage of anger, explosive anger like that, is a recovery time. And a recovery time can be a time to try to reassemble the pieces of whatever it is you just blew up. Love is not easily provoked. The context in which this whole love chapter is, is Paul talking about the power of spiritual gifts. And Paul is saying in this chapter, we summarize the whole chapter, it's love, not anger, that empowers and energizes spiritual gifts. Now, there's a lot in the Bible about anger. I mean, I could just cite a couple of verses out of Proverbs. Uh, if we went to Proverbs 14, 17, we see that a person who lacks, who's angry, lacks sense, is a fool. Well, a fool is someone who's arrogant, someone who's just in stupidity, someone who's in the denial of God's work. And what we know about anger, anger itself actually reduces our cognitive abilities and warps our perception of what's happening around us so that we can't tell what's real or what's not real or what's happening or what's not happening. And we're just, we're looking through a distorted lens when we're angry. Now, if you need an example of this, open Facebook when you go home and look at anything about the election. There's just, or anything about, you know, COVID, or anything about, you're going to find rage. And in that rage, there's a lot of foolishness that goes on. In that rage, there's a distortion that goes on, that anger. Proverbs 22, verses 24 through 30, or 24 and 25. People who are angry, get a, don't hang out with people who are angry because they, you will learn their ways, their, their way of perceiving, their bias. Their, the, the verse has this idea of if you hang in anger, then you end up being biased and prejudiced towards certain people that may, it doesn't even make sense why you're angry toward them. And again, if you need an example of this Verse in Proverbs is open any social media. Why, why this anger that's happening, that's coming out in this name calling and belittling? And well, it's Proverbs 29, 22. An angry man causes strife among brothers. Anger, anger destroys cohesiveness in friends. It destroys cohesiveness in families. Anger tears things apart. And then, then of course, we have James chapter 120. Anger does not work the righteousness of God. Love is not easily provoked. 
anger can lead people down the path of foolishness, a distorted perspective, blowing up relationships, and contradicting the work of God. That day in my truck, I hit all of those. And on my way to the freeway, began to say, God, work in me something different. Anger was triggered by an event. It escalated in me. It hit a crisis point. And then on the freeway, I'm in a recovery period. Lord, how do I pick up the pieces of what I just blew up? Now, love is not easily provoked. It's interesting, Paul says something else about anger uh, to the Ephesian church. And I want I to quote this verse by way of contrast, because what he says in Ephesians and to the Ephesians is, listen, be angry, but do not sin, do not give the devil a place. Now, I read this a couple of times, and I thought, wait, 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 let me read this again. Yep, be angry, but do not sin. Well, here's an interesting dynamic about anger that you, you probably already know, but if you don't, it's a nice insight. Anger is always a secondary emotion. Anger is always a secondary emotion. That is to say that what triggers anger can be irritability, for example, chronic physical problems create irritability in people. Anger can be triggered through that. Frustration can be the trigger behind anger. I tried something, it didn't work like I wanted to, I got angry. Anxiety or fear can be a trigger to anger. Rage can be a trigger to anger. Rage. Best illustration I have for this is a call that I had on a Saturday morning. Pastor Ray, can we come over? My wife and I need to talk to you right now. I quizzed because it was Saturday and I didn't want to have somebody come over, but they needed to come over. And as they came over, this was the story the husband told me. We were making breakfast this morning, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw movement. My wife was coming at me with a butcher knife. She was going to kill him. He wrestled the knife out of her hand, got her to the floor, calmed down the rage that was happening. Now they're at my house wanting to talk about that. I thought, this is a great Saturday morning meeting. I turned to her and I said, well, tell me what happened. She said, we were making breakfast and a song came on the radio. Radio's on, music, one of the music stations. She said, it was the song that was playing in the abortion clinic. When I got the abortion before we were married that he talked me into. Look back at him. You want to tell me about this story? Tell me your side? He goes, we got pregnant before we were married, and I was scared to death about being a dad. I didn't know what to do. And she's right, I did talk her into an abortion. Long and the short of it is, that pain, repressed rage, was triggered by a song. And it had been in there so long and it had gotten so toxic that it was coming out in a murderous rage. Stress can produce anger. Feeling overwhelmed can produce anger. Feeling guilt can produce anger. Anger is a secondary emotion. When Paul says, be angry but do not sin, here's a, and don't give the devil place, there's a great bit of coaching here. And as believers, and particularly if you grew up in the church, I need you to hear something. 
Let me rephrase Paul for a moment. Admit you're angry. I do, I ran a coaching business for a while. I still do a lot of coaching of leaders in my life. One recently, I was coaching and she described something that happened to her in college. And I asked a simple question, how did that make you feel? And I got the most indirect series of ang uh, answers I've ever received as a coach. She went on for 10 minutes. I finally intruded into that, said, excuse me. I said, how did that make you feel? Here's a person, professional woman, very gifted and talented, who is stalled at one level in her life because of something traumatic that happened in college that she was never able to express the anger over the injustice that had occurred to her. Until that appointment. If you're going to be a person who doesn't walk in anger, but instead you're going to walk in love, then the first thing I'm going to suggest is that you need to be a person who can admit when you're angry. You say, well, that seems pretty obvious. Oh, no, it's not. You see, because when people are angry, if they can't admit they're angry, they're masters at blame shifting. They're masters at gaslighting. They're masters at manipulation. They're masters at turning the light anywhere else but their own emotions. Step one, admit that you're angry. Paul is flipping the script on us when it comes to anger. Remember, anger cycle, a trigger, an escalation, a crisis, a recovery. It's right there at the trigger that we can flip the script on anger. Right there at the trigger, whatever has triggered anger, whatever event has happened that causes that anger to come up, here's Here's how you lean into anger. Number one, admit that you're angry. Number two, ask a question. Why is this making me so angry? What am I feeling on the inside? What am I experiencing at an emotional level? You say, well, that sounds pretty simple. Oh, it is. But for some people, it's very scary. Because anger has been denied so long. Emotions have been buried so deep that to actually look at them seems and feels like the whole world can come unglued and fly into oblivion. But it won't. Ask the question, why am I angry? What is happening inside? You inquire, and then you allow the exposure to occur before you and the Holy Spirit of what's really happening. You see, one of the things that anger does is keep us distant and safe from people, particularly where there's pain or injustice involved. And so we get angry to protect ourselves but that anger doesn't serve as a protection forever. Anger can become toxic and destructive in the ways that I described earlier. And so as I ask the question in the face of feeling angry, what's happening on the inside of me, I have to be willing to go down the pathway of exposure to say, this is the emotion I'm really feeling. I'm really feeling anxious right now. Or I'm really feeling fearful right now or I'm really feeling stress right now, or I'm really feeling overwhelmed right now, or I'm really feeling enraged right now at something I've seen. For example, an injustice. And in that exposure, then learning can occur, discipleship can occur, change can occur. 
I say what's happening and I'm seeing it now, I can learn to deal with what is at the root of the anger and learn to walk in a different way in response to the trigger. Love is not easily provoked. The first step in dealing with anger is to admit that you're angry. Then to ask yourself, why is this anger here? Then to allow the exposure to the Holy Spirit to bring change, to work in that deep area that then leads to learning how to live in a different way in the fullness of love, as it would say in Corinthians. Love is not easily provoked. If we do not have love, Paul says at the beginning of the chapter, if we do not have love, then we're just another source of noise and we have nothing. To all my connections on Facebook, here's a good, here's a good thing for you. Look at all your posts. Is it just noise and nothingness? Or is it a communication of God's love? Why are you angry? Love is not easily provoked. Let me leave you with a couple of questions. When you get angry, stop and think. First admit, I'm angry. For some of you in relationship where anger is a pattern, this is going to be a big first step. In fact, what you're going to do is say, I'm angry. Let's put a time out on it. Let me go think about this, about why I'm so angry. For some of you, you're so entrenched in the behavior, I'll tell you right now, you need a mentor. And some of you are so entrenched in behavior, you need a therapist to help you identify what's happening on the inside. You just got the anger, but you don't know why. If you don't know why, that's where a mentor or a therapist will be so helpful in walking you through a conversation to get to that point, to get to that pain, to get to that, that place. This couple that I talked about that came on a Saturday morning, they had been in multiple church services and coaching times, and still there was this blockage in their relationship. They hadn't gotten down to the real hurt until that song came on. And when that song came on, oh, that hurt came gushing out, exploding out. For some of us, we need that in a therapeutic, a clinical context that just help us get there. Stop. Will you internalize a new strategy in facing anger? Instead of getting angry, escalating, crisis, and then trying to recover, trying to repair, instead of that vicious cycle, stop and say, I want to inquire. I'm feeling angry. I want to inquire why. I want to be exposed before God. I want to learn something about God and about me that I didn't know. So the first one is, will you internalize the stop-think strategy? Second question, can you visualize a different way of responding to anger? You say, oh, oh, Dr. Ray, you're getting new agey. No, I'm not getting new agey. There's a lot about vision in the Bible, and I don't have time to go into it, so you can ask me later what I'm talking about. But seeing something different is part of the work of the Holy Spirit. Can you see yourself responding in a different way? 
work on that. Instead of what this pattern is, how can I see myself responding in a new way, in a different way, in a way that's healthy, in a way that's whole, in a way that's right? Will you visualize a new way of responding in anger? And then the third question I want to leave you with is, will you ask a mentor or a therapist for help? Will you ask a mentor or a therapist for help? If you find that the pattern of anger in your life, your life can be summarized as a noisy nothingness, then, number one, will you internalize the stop-think strategy? Number two, can you visualize a new way of responding? And number three, will you ask for help? Because love isn't easily provoked. As I reflected that day on the family that I had honked into probably therapy themselves with my truck. The Holy Spirit asked me a question. Ray, how much different would that engagement have been if you had understood that I put them in front of you? They were obviously looking for something. That I put them in front of you because you are filled with the Holy Spirit in love and you would take the time to help them. Thank you, Lord, for rubbing salt in the wound. Help me see that next time. Help me see that. I'm going to replay this whole event through that picture. God put this bad driver in my way because I have something to say. I'm not just a noisy nothingness. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Lord Jesus, Help us be men and women who love, and especially in this Christmas period, when anger in many families just escalates into crisis. I pray instead that there would be a new love that would break in our hearts a new love that would break in our families, a new love that would break through in our social networks, that would alter the way we see the world around us, that would give us clarity instead of distortion, that would give us hope instead of condemnation, that would give us love instead of prejudice, that would help us act more like you. I pray in Jesus' name. And if you agree, Say, yes, Lord, I will. Thank you, Pastor Ray. I'm, I'm just going to invite Kaylee up. Kaylee can just come up and... We're just going to do her, uh, her microphone and guitar, babe. By the way, when I say babe, it's my wife in the sound booth. It's not... Just to be clarify... Listen, here, here's what I want us to do. Um, I asked Kaylee if we would sing How Great Is Our God. And into that bridge that they sing, Wonderful Counselor. But even as we're singing that, it doesn't require you to sing along. I just want to spend just a few more moments in reflection on what Pastor Ray has just shared for us, the insights he's given us. And what does that mean for us this week as we ponder those questions that he's raised? And then we'll dismiss after we do that. Let's do that. And so great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. And oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God.
is our guide. His name. He's the name above all names. Worthy of all praise. My heart. This week is you. Go about your week. Here's what I know. This is what we've experienced. We're going to be challenged in this area. Adore him. Adore him with all that you are and with all that you have. Share with one another. I love how Ray says, acknowledge you're angry. Share it. We'll come back next week and we'll celebrate all of the good all the bad and all the ugly. Because if we can't share that, the struggle's real all by ourselves. We celebrate all of those things together because we know who God is, who Christ is, and what he's done for us. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face turn and radiantly shine upon you and give you peace today in the coming days, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Lord bless you uh, today. Enjoy your week. All of you who's for Coquilleville, you'll meet uh, Darlene downstairs. A tribe, you'll end up meeting downstairs as well. And I think you're going to have pizza or something or something. Anyways, God bless you. You are dismissed.